power. You are worthy of it all. Revelation 4, you, you spent a little bit of time just singing praises unto the Lord. Hallelujah for his name. I say it every once in a while. There's an awful lot of prayer that goes into the songs that we sing and the praises that we give. And so thank you for joining in. The more the merrier in singing praises to our, our King in Christ alone. First Corinthians chapter number 12. We're back there. We took a bit of a pause last week. A little time out. Uh, I was put in time out. Um, yeah. That must mean that you are a parent if you left, of course. Your kids never go in time out, do they? No, no. But uh, they put me in time out. They let me get out, which is very nice. I Hopefully I learned my lesson. You can learn an awful lot of lessons from a man like Pastor Rob Porter, who has been leading a church for 25, 26 years, been pastoring for over 40, uh, just a a sweet brother and friend of our church, and I'm thankful that he was here for our men's conference. He spoke on God's truth uh, last Sunday out of John 17, and and uh, it took a few days, but we got all the messages up on YouTube. I know they're up on Facebook. Make sure that you take the time, if you're so inclined, especially guys, with our uh, our men's conference. We had our Kindred conference, and we did Friday night and Saturday. Uh, had a little food, had a tremendous amount of fellowship. Uh, thank you, men, for being part of that. You were partakers of a good meal in so many ways, spiritually speaking, that uh, God just really gave us a sweet time. I know that's only a few hours. You know, you, you come together. It's Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday midday. We're all done. And then um, you go, oh. But that's why we add a, a Sunday morning with the preacher, the pastor of that weekend that comes in so that you really can get a a Holy Spirit tie-in from the Word of God on what was going on. And, and it was a good theme uh, coming from 1 Corinthians 2 from a number of months ago that we preached through. Uh, what are we talking about? What are our conversa conversations centered on? And of course, last week's message, God's truth spoke to us deeply. Very thankful, of course, out of John 17. Uh, you can't get much better material in your Bible than Jesus Christ talking to his Father in heaven in complete subjection to the Father in heaven as divine deity Jesus. It was powerful. Of course, we've been having a men's study on Saturday mornings. We've got three more of those. So I just, uh, I just, uh, I invite all of you men to come and they say, well, you've been into the middle of something. You can jump right in. We've got three more and you'll be part of it. I, uh, the book we're reading, you can catch up on that. But we're really getting into the Word of God. And we're studying men that messed up in the Old Testament that God still used. Uh, this past Saturday, yesterday, we, we grabbed a hold of Samson. And so there wasn't a lot there that God used in him. He really failed to give God glory in his life, but it was really a good lesson. It was the antithesis of our study about humility. So it's been good for us, and I thank you men for partaking of it. Thank you men for being part of our uh, weekend, the men's conference, and of course, once again, Pastor Rowe, uh, what a blessing, what a man of God that truly is uh, really just, uh, he's a God man, he's a gospel man, he's a preacher and teacher of the word, most of all, he loves Jesus Christ, and you can tell he loves being around God's people, and he's an outreach guy in the Savannah area where he is pastoring, so again, thank you for his example to us. Real quick, these are out in the lobby, you can still keep on picking these up. You might get your third or fourth or fifth one because you lost the others. But I want to remind you that we are in the 10th Sunday of the, month, of the year. Yes, I said it. I do that every once in a while. The 10th Sunday. We're in the last month of the first quarter. Okay, I'll be quiet. No, I won't. Five weeks from Easter Sunday. Ah! Okay. Just a few days away from next Saturday, which is our dinner theater. Our murder mystery right here in the auditorium, 120 seats, all gone. You say you'd like to go. You're going to have to do some bribing. You're going to have to really get deep in your pocket, and you're going to have. <laughs> but we, uh, we put it out there a week ago, and all 120 seats are taken. If you really, 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 really want to go, 
contact the office and we'll put together a waiting list to see if there's some people that can't go and see if we can find room for you by Thursday or Friday. We'll be setting up 20 plus tables in here. The youth ministry will be serving you and uh, we're going to be having a prime rib, uh, twice baked potatoes, just kidding. We're having a nice chicken dinner though. We'll have a chicken dinner. The dinner of course is, is really uh, just a small piece of what we're doing which is to give the youth an opportunity to raise a couple dollars to serve you, to minister to you, and use the spiritual gifts that they have. Ah, a little segue into 1 Corinthians 12. I knew you'd catch that. One other quick thing to remind you of, with me just mentioning Easter, Resurrection Sunday, of course, our dinner theater coming up on Saturday, our women's conference. That will be here before you know it as well. It is three weeks from this weekend. It is... Uh, on the 24th and 25th. So again, if you wonder what's going on, grab one of these. They're out in the lobby, and you can see what's going on. Oh, oh, one more commercial. Ten seconds. On the back here, it talks about Discover First Bible. There's slides, by the way, that go on all the time around here, if you just stop and watch. But Discover First Bible, we've contacted a number of people that do want to be part of that. Next Sunday, after second service, back in the cafe, we'll feed you lunch and go through our Discover First Bible stuff. And uh, look forward to having those that are already committed to being there. If you're interested and you're just wondering, I've been around at First Bible for a little bit, there's no hard sell. There's no, hey, when you come there, then we're going to take a pint of blood and we're going to, no, no. Just, uh, it's an opportunity for good information. I'll tell you what our church is like, who we are, what we're all about, why we do what we do. And then it'll give you a chance to make a decision prayerfully on the church that God would have you to be part of as God leads you. Which goes to, again, our text in 1 Corinthians 12. That's why I did it today. I don't always uh, talk about things that are going on and, and uh, different um, events. But it really fits with where we're at in our study. Two weeks ago, we were in the first few verses, the first 13 verses. And you'll be reminded... As chapter number 12 unfolds in the beginning there, now concerning spiritual gifts, verse number 1, brother and I would not have you ignorant. I don't want you to be in a place where there is a lack of knowledge and you don't know really how spiritual gifts work. I covered quite a bit of ground two weeks ago. I'm going to go a little bit further this week. You'll get a little bit more. Next week's message is on 1 Corinthians 13. Tremendous message. Uh, excuse me. Tremendous passage. I don't know about the message because I'm going to be preaching it. You know, I don't know. But... What beautiful verses to speak about. They really are the bridge between these two gifts chapters because chapter 14 talks about the problems and troubles with the sign gifts. And so we'll be teaching through that and preaching through it. And so here we are in chapter number 12. And I would like you to have some knowledge and understanding and wisdom. I know that's part of the investor's Bible study on Wednesday night theme as you're finishing up is to know the Word of God a little bit. Grab some understanding. And so... Paul starts off this letter, uh, I mean this, this uh, chapter in this letter saying, Brethren, my brothers in the Lord, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you're Gentiles, I mean, you were once lost, you used to mess around with a bunch of stuff, now you're born again, you're a church, you have the Spirit of God within you. Let me teach you what the spiritual gifts are all about. And so we really looked at that two weeks ago. In fact, let me remind you, up on the screen it says, a spiritual gift is a God-given ability by which the Holy Spirit of God supernaturally ministers to the body of Christ. Believers, we're in a body. I'm going to use three words here quite a bit out of the text. Body, members, one. They're simply in the text quite a bit. And in this supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in the body, we're to minister together and minister to one another. It's something that the Spirit of God does through us as we make ourselves available for his use. I used that a couple of weeks ago, so that's a little bit of a reminder. It says in Ephesians chapter number 4, there is one body, one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. Once you get saved, born again, Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus and saying, hey, there are some God-given graces that you can receive. They're going to pave the way for the church to be what it ought to be. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. The one baptism, it always comes up. Is that the water baptism? No, that's the baptism 
that you as a believer experience divinely. Jesus Christ is the baptizer. He baptized you into his death, raised you in the likeness of his resurrection. You became a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The Holy Spirit then took residence inside of you, and that was a result of Jesus baptizing you, spiritually speaking, supernaturally, into his body. There's the terminology, body of Christ. We are members together. And we would rather not just be members. And as I say often, participants and partakers. But I would rather have you go deeper and be a member that becomes a partner. Partner in the work. That's what the passage of Scripture is saying. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying, hey, I know that I'm born again, he says. I'm a prisoner of the Lord. I used to be. I mean, I'm writing from there. And I'm a prisoner in chains in the prison that I'm locked up in. But now I'm a prisoner of the Lord by my salvation. And I'm going to tell you to walk out your salvation, to walk out the message of Jesus Christ with lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering and forbearing one another, with love. That's the way that we're to be in the body of Christ, one body, one spirit. This is what we covered two weeks ago. Good review real quick to get you in on, and then we'll read the passage from verse 14 down. In, excuse me, intentional unity in the body of Christ welcomes the diversity of gifts from the Holy Spirit and magnifies the name of Jesus Christ. Each one of you has a different package of spiritual gifts from God in his word. You may have a particular speaking gift. Maybe you have the ability to serve and you have a serve gift. Maybe you hold the office of a service where you are called out, apostle, pastor, and on and on. You see, it's a breakdown from the scriptures of what it means to have this gift from the Holy Spirit that he gives you. Not the gifting that would be teach, taught in false doctrinal places where it says, hey, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, the Bible says that he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. In each context, Acts 1-5, baptize with the Holy Ghost. But many of the religions that falsely teach that there's something extra beyond you getting saved and the Holy Spirit come in you and that you're baptized into Christ, they say, ah, oh, the filling of the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit, the ba baptism of the Holy Ghost, they're all just, they're just interchangeable terms. You need to know what the Word of God teaches. You need to know how this all works by God's theology, not by man's twisted theology. Sometimes man takes things upon himself, oftentimes, Take a little bit of scripture. Take a little bit of the mention of Jesus' name. Take a little bit of church culture. Take a little bit of preferences. Take a little bit of some extra scribal words down and some extra rules and ordinances. Put it all in a pot, stew it up, and go, hey, this is the way we're going to live our religion. And it's not based upon the word of God. It's not based on the saving grace of Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Again, Jesus is your baptizer the Holy Spirit is simply the element of your baptism. We're reminded when we looked at this a couple weeks ago that in your salvation, you receive remission and forgiveness. In your salvation, you received justification. And now God sees you through the blood of Jesus Christ and you've been made right. You are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. You're sanctified. Propitiation has been put upon you. Things have been paid for. You have been adopted into a new family. You are part of the body of Christ. You've been regenerated. So much happened to you and me when we got saved. And the Holy Spirit said, hey, I'm going to give you a gift or two. Well, can I sign up with the best ones? Well, hey, real quick, chapter number 12. Verse number 31, the last verse as we finish out in a few minutes. But covet earnestly the best gifts. But don't stop there. Because he says, I'll show you a more excellent way. As verse 1 of chapter number 13 starts off. Charity never fails. Charity never faileth. That's why it's the theme 
of our study. That's why when we stop right here, we're reminded of how much Paul loves this church. And he wants to correct them. He wants to take the scriptures that are given by inspiration of God. They're profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. But if I'm going to teach it in a demeaning way, if I'm going to teach it like I'm some know-it-all, if I'm going to teach it totally the opposite manner of how Jesus taught the truth, without love and meekness, then the love that is from God that never fails really won't come through. And you'll wonder, who is this Jesus? Who is this God? Is this really what the Word of God's about? Is this really what the church is like? Is this really what we're supposed to be all about? No, we're supposed to be about the love that never fails. One of the marks of an individual's growth in their walk as you're walking in the Lord and growing is a greater understanding of your own body. This is a spiritual parallel. There is. As we mature in Christ, we gain a better understanding of the church. Why am I here? Why am I part of a church? Which is Christ's body. You're here for a reason. You're here, unlike a lot of things, culturally speaking, that are lined up for you to receive something, and you will, and you shall, from the Lord, you are here to give. Put yourself before the Lord and say, I'm a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is his reasonable service. That's what he's asking of you as a born-again believer to come before him and say, dear God, I don't know what you'd have for me, but I am willing. I don't know what you'd have for me, but I want you to prepare me. I don't know what is in store for my life, but truly, as it says up on the screen, I want to gain a better understanding of the church, Christ's body. It says in Romans chapter number 12, and I mentioned just the first verse of that, but verses 4, 5, 6, 7, I used this a couple weeks ago. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. There's those three words that Paul uses in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians that he also uses in chapter 12 of Romans. A great parallel passage about the gifts. He also says in verse number 6 and 7, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophesy, prophecy, let us prophesy. According to the proportion of faith or ministry, hey, let us wait on our ministering or he that teacheth on teaching. I say, okay, God, if this is what you're going to put in me, I'll wait for you. In the meantime, I'm going to say, pastor, church leaders, whoever, I'm willing because there may be a spiritual gift in you that God is not using here at the church. It says in verses 8, I mean verse 8, For he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. There's an awful lot, Paul speaking to the church at Rome, the mixture of people in Rome about speaking gifts, that you can have the gift of prophecy, that you can have the gift of teaching, that you can have the gift of exhortation, which are all part of the teaching gifts. And he's basically saying this, these teaching gifts or speaking gifts come from the Holy Spirit, and they're to fit into the body of Christ. I want to have the best gifts. I want to be the one that's used more by God. Well, is it possible that you would rather be recognized more by man than by, used by God? That's a dangerous place, and I don't want to go there in my own life. It says up there on the screen here in the next slide, a church that faithfully uses his gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit is characterized by these three things. I mean, these many things. First three, fellowship, worship, evangelism. Submission, love, obedience, unity and ministry, servanthood. I love this church. I say it every once in a while. I, I can't say it enough. I love how this church faithfully uses its gifts. You say, well, then that means you don't need me. No. You're here for a reason. You're here because the Holy Spirit has led you. If God has led you to be here, then that's what you ought to do in obeying him and saying, okay, 
what God will you do in me? How will you prepare me? How will you teach me? How will you then show me how to be more available and more willing to be used in this church family? Because I want to know how this all works. I want to know how the Holy Spirit gives. You know what? I want to teach the Bible like so-and-so. I want to teach the Bible like so-and-so. I want to be a children's ministry director like so-and-so. I want to run ADP Sports and Happy Five Soccer Club. Okay, well, we have 324 kids. Would you like to start running that tomorrow? Send me an email. As we close registration at midnight last night. But could you say I'm willing to serve? I could do something. I'm available. I got some Saturdays free. And if I don't have them free, I will free them up. Because I want to be part of the church that is called First Bible. That faithfully uses his gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit of God to reach people for Christ. I want to be able to be part of some church that shows the love of Jesus Christ. I want to be part of a church that has examples of people that have submitted to the Lord and have submitted to his leadership and say, God, use me. I want to be unified. I want to be part of the ministry that's saying, missions, family, sports, I want to be part of whatever you're doing. Live faith, love others, declare hope. I want to be part of that. Well, that's who you are. So I'm preaching to you as born-again believers that are members of First Bible that maybe some of you are not, and that's okay too. Then how do you fit? You prayerfully look around and say, do we fit scripture? Do we fit the teachings of Jesus Christ? Do we fit the teachings of the church? Do we fit the teachings and the doctrine and the leadership of all scripture that's given by inspiration of God? We don't leave this scripture out, leave that scripture out. We just throw the gospel around and we add things to the gospel. No, no, no. We love the purity of the scripture that teaches that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. I deliver to you the gospel. It is the love note from heaven through the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's called good news. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves as the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's how you get saved, and then you're in the body. If you're in the body of Christ today, then you want to know a little bit about the team that you're on. So today I just want to call this inside team spirit. We're not going to do a rah-rah. We're not going to do cheers. Can you imagine this bouncing around? No, you don't want to see that. But team Holy Spirit. This is team spirit. This is the way he puts it together. I do not relate things to sports often. Uh, sometimes I, I don't want to go there because it's such a big part of my life. But I, I'm going to use some illustrations today. How many of you have ever been on a team sport any time in your life? Please raise your hand. Please raise your hand. How many of you help coach a team? How many of you have gone to VBSC, Crystal, and been part of a mission team? Yeah, how about, your con how about the concession stand team serving everybody? Hallelujah. You're part of a team. Team spirit. Let me give you some insight inside team spirit from our scripture. Let us read 17 verses. I have three lesson points for you, and I will be done rather quickly. Stay with me here. Let's pick it up in verse number 14. Follow along with me. Scripture is always up there if you don't have it. But if you have, have a Bible, put it on your lap. If you have an electronic version, use that. Let's do it. Verse 14. For the body is not one member but many. What a great team concept. Very simply, right off the bat, it's not one person. But it's many. Many members. Look out for the word one. Look out for the word members. Member, members, look out for the word body. Okay? Verse 15. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? Just a quick thought. Why does he use foot right off the bat? Because your feet, for the most of you, are pretty ugly. Come on now. It's a time of transparency. Come on. We're at church. Feet are ugly. Well, let's go. Maybe your feet are nice, but your toes are kind of, yeah. But if you have nice feet, hallelujah. But he's using a simple illustration of body parts saying, a hand would look a lot nicer than a foot. I guess we'll get rid of the foot because the foot wants to be a hand. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. We can use that. We can use the foot. Verse number 16. Check it out. And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Now, again, this is just, this is just you know, this is just me stretching things a little bit. Why ear and eye? Well, it's very simple. All you guys look at your spouse and say, 
Oh, I love how beautiful your ears are. How you look at me with your beautiful ears. They are right. It's eyes. It's eyes. And you as a spouse, man, should look at your wife and say, I love your eyes because they're so beautiful. But don't mention her ears, okay? Unless they're really beautiful. Then it's okay. But it's interesting. Foot for the hand. Ears for the eye. Just, just a couple of things. You, you know, I don't know. You guys. After you read the Bible a few times, you go, I'm not looking for anything extra, but I wonder, how did the Spirit of God put that in here? Paul, you're pretty funny. You know? Verse 17, here you go. Consider how this unveils. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? I know some of you wives would say that seems to be the way your husband is. They have no ears, only eyes. I'm only picking on the guys today there, Derek. I'm not picking on the girls. You know, it's just the way it is. Sometimes you just got to see the word. If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? Oh, boy. Boy, if I couldn't smell things. I know some of you get the flu a few years. I don't know. I feel bad for you. I do. My schnozzle can smell. Ooh, good feet, good, good food, smelly feet, smelly food. I'm with you. But we're thinking here in this whole, I mean, I've got to get, got to get into the text here. Think of the illustration you got here. He's really going extensively far off the map to grasp your attention by the Spirit of God on what this body principle means, what this one principle means, what you and I as members, no matter how much we think we're less comely, less honorable, that we think we're not useful, or God's just put us together and being less than somebody else, he is saying everyone in the body of Christ is here to be used by God. Everyone, every single person. You are all valuable. Every single one of them in the continent of Jesus Christ, you are so valuable to him. And you need to know that just because you think you're a certain way, this church does not value you sometimes the way you think you're valued. I value in the name of Jesus Christ. I value by the word of God. It says here, verse number 19. Verse number 18. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as he it has pleased him, and they were all members. Where were the body? But now are they many members, yet one body. I got this, a team thing. Lots of players, lots of everything, but it's one. We're one. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, verse 21, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. How arrogant that would be. Churches do that stuff. We do that stuff by human nature. We're degrading people, and we're trying to eliminate people because they don't have what we have. And the Holy Spirit, uh-uh, it's not supposed to be that way. God says, everyone. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again head to the feet, I have no need of thee, of you. Verse 22, nay, much more of those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. These are good synonyms, feeble, uncomely, less honorable. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our com uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God had tempered. God heated it all up. He put it all together. He melded it together. So I'm tempering it. I'm trying it. I'm melding you all together. You've got to give him some time to do that. It might take him a few decades. But he's putting it all together the way that he wants it. He's tempering things. He's trying because if you temper some steel, it's going to be ready for a battle. You temper the steel. You temper the metal. You continually beat on it, and then you get it in the hot, hot fire. And that's what God's doing for his church. I'm going to put it together. I'm going to put it together. Have me give more abundant honor to that part which lacks. Verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Very simply, that word schism means division. Very simple. He doesn't want that. He doesn't want dissension in the ranks. He doesn't want guys in the bench saying, you stink, I'm better than you, coach, you better get me in there. Well, every player that I ever saw that did that usually fell on their face. You might just work hard and go do your job, and maybe you'll get a chance by the king of glory who will put you in. That's the way this goes. The schism, really simply, if you look it up in your blue letter Bible, in your concordance or whatever, and you start tracking it down, there's one other spot. 
in one of the places. The only time that it's mentioned in your Bible. But there's a, a word that relates to its meaning. It's called rent. What happened to the veil of the temple? It was rent in twain from top to bottom. That means it was torn. That's what this word schism means. We don't want to be torn apart. We want to be fused together. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. I love that verse. Verse 27. Let me say it again. Now ye are the body of Christ. Ah, together. Members in particular. You're particular to him as a unit together and also individually. That's the way he sees us. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Paul says, hey, with a little bit of truth and maybe a little bit of but covet earnestly the best gifts. Yet I show, excuse me, yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And then verse number one of chapter three show, 13 shows up. You have all of that and you don't have charity, you have nothing. What is he trying to say this morning as we look at this text? Inside team spirit, as it says up there, inside that team spirit thinking, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, the love of Jesus Christ, putting it all together. Okay, so I went through the text, made some comments along the way, and prepared you real quickly. Now here we go. I've got three lesson points. They won't take long, but they'll fit. Think of this team concept. Think of probably the most relatable team sport concept to the body of Christ as any. It's not football. It's not basketball. It's not. It's baseball. Why? Because baseball has nine individuals on the field attempting to make outs, and they each have to do their job like each one of you have to. Each one of you has to go out into left field, center field, right field, and reach the people with the gospel. You say, well, I don't like right field because the fans are really bad over there. <laughs> I don't want to talk to them. But the left field fans are nice, especially at the Green Monster in, in Fenway which they never had any. Now they get the fans up top and they, well, anyway, those Boston fans, they're difficult. There's nobody from Boston here, is there? I went to UMass, so hey, I got you beat. But you think about that real quick. They are a team, and it's a team sport, but each one of them has an individual job to do. Baseball is the only team sport that you don't have the ball to score runs. You take the ball and you throw it so the other team can score, and you prevent them from scoring. Now, I know that all of you here, and I, I don't like to compare 9 and 10.30, but I kind of have to today. Maybe you guys will get this a little bit better. I don't know. At least help the old guy. Here's the secret. When you're on defense in baseball, you have the ability to do one of two things. Give the offensive team only three outs or give them more than three outs by walking the, the hitters, giving up errors and failures. Simply put, here's the secret to baseball to be successful. Only give the offensive team three outs. Now, isn't that major doctrine for you right there? Softball, baseball, what happens, Craig, when you give the other team four outs? You don't win. It was only supposed to be three. What's my point, spiritually speaking, today as we give these three points? Every one of you have a members in particular gifting by the Spirit of God to do the thing that he wants you to do in the body of Christ to make us better together. We together have this incredible, big, huge, collective assignment of doing it together so that the community knows that we are salt and light that we believe in the gospel, we believe in the word of God, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's who we are. 
and people know it, and so they sign their children up for a sports program so they can experience what we are, which is the lovers of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the givers of the good news, the people that love the Word of God, the people that are moved together by the Spirit of God to be one body. Okay? So now, all of that set up makes this really easy. So the first thing is this. When we look at team spirit with spirit gifts, any injury to a part of our body makes the disabled list in our church. Do people know what, do you know what a disabled list in sports is? What happens if Patrick Mahomes gets hurt? He goes on the disabled list. They got to get him into rehab. All of you are like, <laughs> we're not going to win the Super Bowl. He hurt his ankle. <laughs> That's what you, you don't whine. And, uh, he's on the disabled list. Boy, they got him off rather quickly. I don't know what chemicals they used. I know it was the healing power of God and all you Christians praying for him. Oh, Father God. Okay. This is a spiritual side. Spiritual disabled list. I'm older now and I can't do the things I used to do. I wish I did more while I was younger. Disabled list. I can't go visit people because my car is broken down. I can't come to church because I'm sick. Those are some safe ones. How about these? I used to be willing to serve God, but now I'm no longer willing. I used to be prepared, but now I don't want to read my Bible. I don't pray. I don't do anything. You're on the disabled list, spiritually speaking. There's a lot of you that have been put on the disabled list not by your own volition or choice. Just things have happened in your life. But some of you have fought through the spiritual disabled list and said, please, God, could you use me in some form or fashion? I am willing. It says up there on the screen, if you are a member of the body of Christ, you can rest assured that you have divinely appointed functions. An organ that rests or fails to function brings undue hardship to the rest of the body. You're needed. And so many of you that said, I'm willing, thank you. Thank you. We're able to accomplish things in this ministry that churches double our size can't or don't or won't. But it's all by faith. <laughs> it's all by grace. It's not by us. It's by God's incredible good graces. And that's where we land. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, the last two verses of last time's message, in verses 12 and 13, for as the body is one and hath many members, remember, I'm highlighting a word here, body, for as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of the one, that one body, being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, now we're all believers. Whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit. That is the beauty of us looking at team spirit with spirit gifts and saying any injury to a part of our body makes the disabled list in our church. We need to get people off the disabled list. We got to get people like, again, I'll use Mahomes again. He got off the disabled list rather quickly. Well, he had incredible trainers and incredible people. Guess what? You've got the best trainer in the whole wide world. You get the best physical therapist in the whole wide world. The holy God of the universe has given you the word of God to heal your soul, to put you back in the game. Maybe you need somebody to show you and teach you. That's okay. We have plenty of people around here who would love to take the word of God and show you how to get off the disabled list. Team spirit with spirit gifts, the disabled list comes. Secondly, team spirit with spirit gifts means this. Every gift provides our members ability to feel the position in our church. Every gift provides our members ability to feel the position. You can go into the field and feel the position. The ground ball comes, you catch it, you throw it to first, and you make the play. When you say, hey, I can work in children's ministry, hey, I can help out in the coffee house, hey, I can be a, 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 an usher and help out there, I'm willing to teach the Bible. I've only been saved three or four years. Could somebody please train me and teach me? 
Yes, we have one-by-one -one discipleship to start you out with. You can learn the doctrines of the church. We have groups, Sunday groups, where you can learn something about discipleship. You can learn something about ministry. We have a Bible institute that you can learn. We have ministry leader prep to, train, to prep and to train leaders in ministry. It says here, when you look in your scripture, in the Bible here, in verse number 24, for our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Boy, you could get people off the disabled list that are spiritually hurting by having a care one for another. Hospitality gift, serve gifts, discerning of spirits gifts. It says up there, the diversity of members declares the inadequacy of each member to function on his own. You are incapable on your own. And shows the need for the interdependability within the body. I am dependent upon you. Deeply dependent upon you. You are dependent upon others. Stop running from that interdependence. You are part of something that is totally and completely dependent by the word, by the spirit, by the Lord Jesus Christ to work together. We need to work always together. And when we do, it's beautiful. There's 40-something people that have signed up to sing. You say, that's just a simple talent that you can work. It is, but it's a powerful talent. And when you put all that talent together, it'll be a spirit gift, giving the gospel to people while they sing on Resurrection Sunday. You need unity to do that, don't you? All 40-something people cannot sing whatever they want to. The less comely, they fit, they work. Speaking gifts, sign gifts. I do believe that the sign gifts, and we'll get into chapter number 14 when we get there, they really are, they were for a time, a temporary time, and we'll work through that, and I'll look and see what it has to say in the scriptures. Ephesians chapter number 2 reminds us that we're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints in the household of God. We're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone, chief cornerstone. Say, Pastor, you've used this earlier in our, uh, our study in Corinthians. Absolutely. It's a great, powerful passage. It says in verses 21 and 22, the key piece of how in Jesus Christ you and I fit together, there's no other temples to be built. There's no other buildings to be built because he has built him a living building. You are the household of God. He has built you and me together. We are his body. We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed Together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. That's what happens when you're born again. That's what happens when you're saved. When you're on the disabled list, you want to get back into it. It doesn't mean you're completely forgetting. You're still part of the body, and you're still very important as one of the members. <sighs> but you'd like to be functioning in a, in a higher and deeper way. I hear you. That's why the church works so well. Verse number 26, when it says, whether one member suffer or all members suffer with it. When, when you suffer, we all suffer together. We're together in this. It says up there, we are builded together. We are together. There's something powerful about the body of Christ that sometimes we just, we just don't grasp. All the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. When someone says, thank you for your church doing such and such for us, all, all honored in the name of Jesus. That's God. That's you. We're able to send thousands of dollars to the mission field. That's you. We're able to send people to the mission field. That's all. When a pastor comes and says, thank you for the way you treated me. Thank you for the men's conference. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. It's you that are being thanked and honored. You are honored by the Holy Spirit of God. And I thank you for the honor and privilege of pastoring. All of you. Lastly, very simple. Third one. You know I'm not too complicated here. Because the word of God really a lot of times is very straightforward. You say, I want to learn all about the spiritual gifts. Call Brian Calloway. Pastor Brian will teach you everything. That's what I told everybody on Tuesday at Refined. I was there for the Discover class, and I 
talked about some things. They had questions. I said, talk to Brian. He'll tell you everything. That's a good deal. Call up the office. Talk to Pastor Dwayne. Call up Bobby. I mean, he, call up Bobby. Everybody got his cell phone number. Ask him. He'll tell you everything. If you want to learn about the spirit gifts completely and deeply, I'm teaching you what I can from the scripture in 45 to 50 minutes on a Sunday, but there's more here. There's so much more here. Salvation in Jesus promotes, thirdly, our one. We said body, members, one. Salvation in Jesus promotes our one purpose for unity in our church. We are one. Verse number 27, and ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. We are one in Christ. The body rises and falls as a unit. We rise and fall together. We are honored and take on the bumps and bruises together. We suffer together, as I said a minute ago. This moves us to the place where you go, okay, now that we have this salvation in Jesus that we've been talking about this whole time, how does it promote this one purpose to be one together for unity in our church? Verse 28 and 29 and 30 have some great questions. Well, I want to be an apostle. Well, did you see the resurrection of Jesus? Well, in text, I know the meaning of it. You would be a sent out one, a missionary. And that's how we look at that sometimes today. But it says there, hey, teachers, prophets, miracles, helps. I want to do all that. Are all, I love verse 29. Are all, are all, are all, are all. Verse 30. Have all the gifts of healing. Do all speak with tongues. Do all interpret. By the way, tongues very simply is this. There's a big difference between unknown tongue in your scripture and tongues. Tongues is a different language that is spoken by someone that has to have an interpretation if someone doesn't interpret it. But if someone has given the gift of tongues, spiritually speaking, in this day and age, it would be a different language that they've been given to give the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to someone. An unknown tongue does not give glory to anyone but the person that's doing it. The unknown tongue is gibberish. The unknown tongue is not biblical for giving glory to God. Tongues is a gift that's given by God, by the Holy Spirit, so someone can speak German when they don't know any, and they come and talk to a German, and they're able to give them the gospel and say, in German, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. It's like speaking Spanish. I remember L.G. Long learning another tongue. You were able to speak in tongues in Central America, were you not? God gave you that gift. It's powerful. You used to say, Brownie, how can I learn another language? I can't even speak English. No, I, I put that in there. I'm sorry. <laughs> I understand that that was a gift from God. That's a Holy Spirit gift. And the interpretation was the person was able to understand. You follow? Where am I at here with this? The salvation in Jesus Christ promotes our one purpose for unity. Look up on the screen as I pull this all together. The church is likened unto a team. I've been talking about it. Now I'm just putting it all together. An organic entity. You are alive. You're a living organism. Yes, we have to have organization. I say that. We have to be organized. Governments. That's part of the administration. You have to have those things. It's gifts. But we're a living organism. Individual success and accomplishment contributes to the effects and affects the whole. Likewise. Individual suffering and tragedy, which is tough, comes to the body. It affects the whole. In either case, the body moves and lives as one. Right here, verse 31. But covet earnestly the best gifts. I won't give away what I'm going to preach next week right now. But here's a commercial because I will start in verse 31. And yet show I unto you a more excellent way. He's telling us something very clear as it comes 
in the book of Colossians chapter number 3. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond, the unifier of perfectness. Perfectness meaning completeness. It'll be completely put together by him. So we need to put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness in Christ alone. Pastor George Grace preached on chapter 2, chapter number 3. He covered this months ago. And it keeps on coming back to us because this is written to one of the churches thousands, a couple thousand years ago, just like for us. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which, for the reason also, ye are called in one body. Ah, and be ye thankful. Be thankful for everyone in the body of Christ. Be thankful for your children at home as a family if you have kids. Be thankful for the children of other families that have given you the opportunity to minister to them. Give thanks to the people that teach the Bible, that take care of the children, people that welcome people and make a cup of coffee for you. Be thankful for the people that break down Scripture and have been studying all week long and also working 60 hours a week because they want to bless you. Be thankful because we are called in one body. You are part of the body of Christ. And we are his local church, First Bible Baptist Church. Here's your question for our prayer time and invitation. What is your spot? What is your place in the body as a valued member, unified as one in Christ alone? Please bow your heads for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we've covered lots of ground today in the name of Jesus. Jesus, you are the living word. You are the word that became flesh and dwelt among us and gave us the example of the one. You saved our souls so we could be members of your body. And so as us being one together, your body, the body of Christ, many members, comely and less comely, honorable, less honorable, feeble, not feeble. We are all in Jesus, in Christ alone. I pray in this time of prayer, the next couple of minutes, that you will really work upon the hearts in a further way. I know you've been working by your spirit already. Please, God, stir us to consider what is our place if we haven't found it? What is our place of oneness as a member in the body of Christ in Jesus' name? Please stand.